Welcome back to another retro review. Sega released Beyond Oasis in 1995 for the Genesis, an action-adventure game played in the overhead perspective. When people talk about this game, it's either described as an amazing game or a mediocre Legend of Zelda ripoff. I took the time to play through this game, and I feel it falls in neither of those two categories, but ends up being an average game that has a lot of potential. So here it is, my review and thoughts on Beyond Oasis. Released under the title Story of Thor in Japan in December of 94, it would be renamed Beyond Oasis when released in North America in the spring of 95. The game was developed by Ancient, a development studio founded by video game music legend Yuzo Koshiro. Prior to this release, Ancient worked on Sonic the Hedgehog for the Master System, Streets of Rage 2 and 3, ActRaiser 2, and Robotrack. This would be their first adventure-style game, and Yuzo Koshiro would produce this game in addition to composing the music. The game would be successful enough to warrant a second game called Legend of Oasis and was released two years later on the Saturn. This would be a prequel to Beyond Oasis. There's another Sega RPG for the Game Gear called Defender of Oasis, but that game has no relation to this Oasis series. Sadly, like many games that tried to find success on the Saturn, we'd never see another game in the series. Because I had some pretty mixed feelings about this game, I'm going to divide up the review into things I liked and things that I didn't like. Let's start with what I liked about the game. The graphics are pretty good for the Genesis. Sprites are incredibly detailed and also quite large. Also, the use of color is something you rarely see on the Genesis. The choice of color palette is bright and vibrant, and the use of colors almost seems like they're putting more color on screen than most Genesis games out there. There's not much use of special effects, unfortunately, and only a little bit of parallax scrolling, mostly in the mountainous areas. Bosses are huge and are the most interesting designs of anything in the game. Small touches like birds landing to eat something off the ground and then flying away add to the charm of the graphical presentation. The sound is also really good. Enemies have three to four different death screams and the sampling is pretty high quality. It's always satisfying to hear the scream in agony as they die. I find it amusing to think about the voice actor screaming like this into a microphone like he's being attacked and slain himself. Attack sounds always sound like they have some weight to them, and there's plenty of ambient sound in the world as well, making the game seem alive. The music is vibrant, and a much different style than what people come to expect from Koshiro. It feels more like an epic fantasy game. You're not going to get the fast-paced rocking themes like Ease Vanished Omens, or the intense electronic beats of Streets of Rage. The music works in this game, but I feel like it could have had more themes that were memorable. I finished the game only a few days ago, and none of the tracks really stuck with me like Kashiro's other compositions. In terms of gameplay, I liked what really helped set this apart from it being a Zelda clone. Your character, Prince Ali, starts with a knife, but you have several slots in your inventory for more weapons. You can collect different swords, crossbows, and bombs. These can be found in treasure chests or dropped randomly by an enemy. All of these weapons have limited uses before they break, so I guess that makes Breath of the Wild somewhat of a Beyond the Oasis clone. I didn't actually mind this because you get tons of these weapons throughout the game. In fact, through the first several dungeons, I was saving my weapons for bosses, and it got to the point where I was finding so many of these that I didn't have room in my inventory and would have to throw away an unused weapon for a stronger one. There are several infinite use secret weapons that you can find. The trials to overcome these for, are generally incredibly difficult. For instance, the infinite Omega Sword is found at the end of a secret 100 floor gauntlet where you can't use any healing items. Another great gameplay mechanic is the spirits. You'll acquire four different ones. Ditto is a water fairy, Ifrit is a fire djinn, Shade is a mirror image of you, and Bo is a man-eating plant. Each one can be summoned by casting a light ball into a particular type of object. The water fairy is summoned by casting the ball of light into water, the djinn by casting it fire, the shade by casting into a mirror or reflective object, and Bo the killer plant summoned by casting into another plant or a flower. Each spirit must be used to progress through parts of the dungeon. You might need Ditto to put out a wall of fire or have Shade reach across a gap to pull you to the other side with his shadow form. They also have unique attacks and will help you fight enemies and even the bosses. The length of the game is alright. There's nine dungeon areas and it took me a little over six hours to complete the game. 
I feel like this was a good amount of time, as it didn't overstay its welcome with padded out content. I didn't find anywhere near all the crystals throughout the world. These increase the magic power of your spirits. I also didn't manage to get all the secret infinite weapons, so there's some replay value attached to the game in the form of finding all the secrets and crystals. The layout of the island as well as the dungeons seems very well planned out, and it was easy to navigate through. There are many puzzles to solve in order to advance, and most of them revolve around using your spirits. None of them were difficult in the sense that I was able to easily figure out what I was supposed to do to solve it, though those actions themselves might have been a bit tricky. The boss fights were the most fun part of the game. I really enjoyed figuring out the patterns, and each boss did something unique. At half health, they start new patterns so you don't end up repeating the same actions over and over again, like some games with very predictable boss fights. The last thing that I really liked were the cutscenes. There's only one at the beginning and one at the end, but they're very well animated with beautiful screen art. Definitely some of the better artwork for the Sega Genesis. Now let's talk about the things that I didn't like about this game, starting with the story. It starts out quite promising, but declines into incredible mediocrity. You play as Prince Ali of the Island of Oasis. You go on treasure hunting adventures, and on your last trip, you find a golden armlet. You put it on, and suddenly you're bombarded with, mo with knowledge. There was a battle long ago between the bearer of the gold armlet and the silver armlet. The silver armlet causes chaos and destruction, while the gold summons spirits of nature. The evil was destroyed, and the armlet sealed away, but now there's a new bearer of the silver armlet, and now you have to save the world from chaos and destruction. It's about as basic as can be. You're the good guy, and you must defeat the evil guy. No reason is given to why the evil force wants to destroy the world. They're just out to cause mayhem because they're evil. This is a, there is a plot twist at the end, but it's not enough to save the story from its blandness. You simply go from location to location in search of the spirits to help you defeat the evil, because they're evil. On top of that, there aren't many people in this world to talk to. There's a castle with your father, the nameless king, and your sister who also doesn't have a name. Some generic guards and a town of around 10 people who also have no identity. You, your older sister, and the spirits, and the final boss are the only people in the game even given names. The villagers always say the same single line of dialogue across the entire game. Ultimately, the world feels kind of empty, and there's no interesting conversation with NPCs to help the plot seem a little less generic. Most of the dialogue from villagers is very simple, and it's go do this, or you need to do this task next. It's not very interesting. Next up are the gameplay issues that range from annoying to downright frustrating. First, let's cover the controls. The game is 3-button compatible, but you really need a 6-button controller. That's because the X, Y, and Z buttons are crucial for accessing your map, weapons, and items on the fly. Without it, you'll be constantly going into the pause menu to navigate to these things, breaking up the intense combat. Next, there are too many controls and too few buttons. The B button attacks, but it's not that simple. Fast tapping the button initiates a fast attack. Pressing the button for a moment initiates a strong attack that's slower. And holding the button for a few seconds allows you to enter a D-pad movement for a combo or strong attack. The C button is also overcrowded. Tapping C lets you jump, but pressing C makes you crouch. On top of that, you have to tap really fast, otherwise you'll crouch, which will cause you to fall into a pit or take a hit from an enemy that you didn't intend to. There really isn't a good reason for crouching in the game either, except for accessing a few secret areas, so it shouldn't have even been included. The A button is for your spirits. Pressing it casts your light ball to summon. Once summoned, they have three different abilities activated by either tapping, double tapping, or holding the button. That's 12 different abilities total on a single button, and you really have to know which does what, since they can suck up your magic meter really, really quick. Since all the face buttons are used, the only way to run, which you'll need to do a lot, is to double tap the D-pad. I'll admit that all these things you can do in the game are quite ambitious, but it's just too much for three buttons, and too often you'll end up doing something you didn't intend on accident. Another annoyance is the hit detection. You have a giant hitbox, yet enemy hitboxes are very small and require very precise pre positioning. 
It'll look like you're hitting the enemy, but nothing happens because you're off by a pixel or two. I feel like if the enemy can hit you with a close range attack while in physical contact with you, you should be able to hit them from that same position. Especially when your weapon passes right over their sprite, but you're a pixel away from actually getting the hit. Finally, and possibly the worst thing in this game, which made me want to quit playing several times, is the platforming. This game is filled with pits and moving platforms where you need to accurately jump to complete them. Unfortunately, the controls are very awkward and the jumping mechanic is really bad. Not only do most of your jumps fail to how fast you need to tap to avoid crouching, but there's a slight delay in his jump and you slide a little bit when landing. It's really hard to gauge your landing position too since you can't see your shadow while jumping over a pit. It's also really difficult to jump at a diagonal, so of course the game makes you do this a lot. Then they throw in enemies that'll shoot you while you're standing on a moving platform, causing you to fall off. At least it only takes some of your health away when, when you fall in a pit, instead of instantly killing you. Overall, the game isn't bad as it might seem from my criticisms, but there are some large flaws that leave this in the mediocre tier of games. It was fun at times, but some of the more frustrating issues just got in the way of me really enjoying the game. It's not one that I think I'll ever be returning to, and after playing this, I'm not at all interested in checking out the prequel on the Saturn, especially with the disc only running more than $100 right now. On top of that, the entire plot of the prequel is completely spoiled in a cutscene from this game. An original copy of Beyond Oasis is getting pretty expensive too, but there are so many ways to play this today without using an emulator or flash cart. It's available on the Nintendo Switch Online Expansion Pack subscription service. It's also in all of the Sega Genesis compilations, starting with the Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection for the PS3 and Xbox 360. Finally, it's also available on Steam, either part of the Genesis Collection or individually for 99 cents. If you like overhead action adventure games, it's worth at least checking out once. If you're on the fence about these type of games, this one isn't going to win you over. I'd recommend much better ones like any of the 2D Legend of Zelda games, Golden Axe Warrior for the Master System, or 3D Dot Game Heroes on the PS3. I'd love to hear what you think about this game in the comments, especially if you're in those groups that absolutely love this game or hate it for ripping off Zelda. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.